Earth's may look like the moon, but it's really the island in the sky. Join me next time on Trailside. Hey, hey, bear. Hey, hey, bear. I'm making noise like this because I don't want to startle a bear. You're the top of the food chain around here. Hi, I'm John Veeman. Join me in Katmai National Park as we make our own adventure with grizzlies on Trailside. Funding for Trailside is made possible in part by Chevy Trucks, who reminds you that it's possible to have fun outdoors and still leave Mother Nature with a smile on her face, too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And High Tech Sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure. mountains we were flying over? About 3,500 feet. See, that's not very high, but you know, from down here at sea level, they sure look big. Yeah, they do. Hey, how'd you get started in this business? My father started a flying service in Naknek in 1949, and uh, I grew up in the business and been flying here for about uh, 31 years. Well, that's a long time. You must have some good advice for people looking to hire a bush pilot. Well, don't go out with the first guy with a baseball hat and a pair of fancy sunglasses. <laughs> But seriously, uh, look for a company that's been in business locally for a long time yeah. and uh, has pilots who are familiar with the local area. Oh, yeah. Good points. Now, what about packing for a plane trip? Any advice there? Yeah, always I'll pack as uh, light as you can get by with mm -hmm. uh, or be prepared to pay extra money for bringing your gear in. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, these planes only have uh, so much space and room, as you yeah. can see. Also, dress for the uh, environment you'll be flying over. Mm. You never know when it uh, might be handy. Yeah. Now, you know what time to pick me up, right? Yeah, let's see. We have you down for the morning low tide of the 17th. That's it. Thanks for the ride in, George. All right. Finding a good bush pilot is a big part of getting around safely up here. But weather can wreak havoc on any schedule you set for drop-off or pickup. It's not like commercial airlines where you might be a few minutes late leaving your gate. Up here, you could be days or even weeks of waiting for the weather to clear. And further complicating things for us are the tides. This landing area is gonna be underwater an hour from now. Hey, John, good to see you. Hey. How was your flight? Oh, it was great. You know, that, so that ride in, the scenery is just spectacular. That yeah, sure is. I'll be hiking with Carl Schock, an avid backpacker. He's hiked the entire 2,000 mile Appalachian Trail. He's also one of the few people to hike the Katmai Coast, which was part of a mapping project for the National Park Service following the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Came out a week early to update his research. Hey, Carl, anything special you bring for backpacking in bear country? I take my binoculars. <laughs> no, I meant something like a bear deterrent, you know, like pepper spray or something. Well, the pepper sprays have only been proven effective at very short distances. Uh -huh. And if you discharge them into the wind, they can actually incapacitate you. And lastly, they're in a pressurized can, and most airlines and air taxis won't allow them on board. But some people do take bear bells, which mm -hmm. they attach to their pack or on their boots. Yeah. But the noise is often drowned out by wind and water. Oh. And lastly, some people prefer to take flares.
but I found that flares, because they're very hot, can actually injure a bear mm -hmm. or start a fire. Okay, well, you've ruled out just about everything. What's left? Well, I rely on something you can't buy in any store, and that's sound judgment and a cool head. Okay, well, you're going to hopefully show me a little bit of that on this trip, huh? Is that where we're headed? Yeah, I'll show you the route on this map. Okay. We're at the head of this bay, and we'll follow the shoreline south. Mm -hmm. There are no trails here, and it's very difficult hiking in the tall grass and bushes. So what we'll try to do is walk along the tide flat at low tide. There is a section of coast here where at mm -hmm. high tide we'll have to divert our route and follow the bluff. So it sounds like we should be uh, going when the tides are right, right? That's right. In fact, it's low tide, so let's take this tent down and we'll get going. Okay. So when you hiked the Katmai Coast, you did it all by yourself? Parts of it I'd hike by myself, but more commonly I had uh, a marine biologist with me and also an archaeologist. Yeah, why don't we stop up here? There's a salmon stream below us. We may see some bears. Okay. And you get a real nice view of the coast up here, too. Yeah, this is a beautiful spot. Hey, what size binocs are you using? These are 8x30s. Oh. Well, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out what size binoculars you need. The first number, in this case 8, is the magnification. And the second number, 30, is the size of the front lens. The greater those numbers, the bigger and brighter your image size. That also means that your binoculars are going to be larger. So somewhere you have to make a decision as to how much binocular you want to carry in terms of size and weight. And these are 7 by 24. Any tips for using binoculars up here, Carl? Well, it is more complicated than just looking through them. Uh -huh. What I do is slowly sweep an area and try not to fix on any one object. Mm -hmm. Once that's finished, you can repeat the cycle, go over the same area again, and look to see if anything has moved or if anything looks unnatural. Okay. I see a lot of logs down there. Yeah. If you move a little to your left, take, check out that log on the right bank. What do we got there? It looks like a brown bear. Now, we're a safe distance from that bear, right? We're not in any danger up here. We're safe for now. Mm -hmm. That bear is not threatened by our presence, but when we cross that salmon stream, the whole situation could change. How big do you think it is, anyway? That three-year-old, I'd say he's between three and 400 pounds. Oh. So when he stands up, how tall is he going to be? Oh, between six and eight feet, I'd say. John, there's another bear approaching the bear that's been sleeping and has just been noticed. That other guy doesn't look like he's rattled at all. He's a little bit uncertain about his position. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to tell what he's up to. He might just be testing uh, the older, larger bear uh -huh. to see exactly where or how he defines his territory limits. Now, at a different time of year, these bears would probably be a little, little more edgy, right? Because uh, right now they're pretty fat and well-fed. That's also right. There's a, there's a salmon run going on right now. The silver salmon are moving upstream to spawn, and mm -hmm. the bears are feeding on them. Mm -hmm. At other times of year, or further inland, where there is less food, these bears may be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we should keep in mind also when we're hiking. Why don't we move on, John? We'll see lots more bears later. Okay. So how dangerous really is it to hike in grizzly or, I mean, brown bear? Well, which is it, grizzly or brown bear? It actually doesn't make any difference. They're the same animal. Oh, really? So how dangerous is it to hike in grizzly country then? Well, it really is a question of danger, and there really is no reason to be afraid of them. It's more important to learn as much as you can about bears, their behavior, and then respect them in the land that they live in. Like us, each bear has its own personality and will behave differently. But it's good to keep in mind that they will be aggressive when startled. So I guess the key is to not startle them, huh? That's right. So now is there a situation that you, I mean, are there situations you can get in that you, you want to avoid? I mean, is there any natural signs that you can tell there's a bear around? Sure. The most obvious one that I can think of is if you're walking along and all of a sudden you smell something rotting. Uh -huh. Or if you see magpies or ravens circling. Oh, okay. This could be an indication that a bear has cached food nearby. Uh oh, cached food. Now that's pretty unusual. What's going on there? It is unusual. In fact, it's unique to brown bears. What they do is, after making a kill of a large animal, they can only eat so much. 
So they'll store the rest and cover it with twigs or other vegetation. And then they'll lay nearby. Now what do you do if you happen to finally see a bear? What kind of, what kind of reaction you, can you expect to see? Well, the most common reaction from a bear if they see you is to run away. After all, they are trying to avoid you. They could also appear to ignore you. If you see a bear, they may be looking down, continuing their feeding, but actually they're keeping a close eye on you. Okay. And that's a good time to leave the bear alone. Also, they can invite you to leave if they feel that you're too close. An invitation to leave. Uh, now, how do you know you're getting an invitation to leave? Well, they'll give you signals. For instance, they may turn sideways. It's called posturing. Uh -huh. it, it makes them appear bigger. They can also look straight at you and pop their teeth, or they may appear to yawn. These are all signs of stress. Also, yeah. they may charge you. Oh, that's a pleasant thought. <laughs> well, it is, but keep in mind that most charges are bluffs. Uh -huh. They're called off after they come within 15 or 20 feet of you. Oh. What they're trying to do is make you run. This is an indication to them that you might be a prey. So the important thing is to stand your ground and not run. It's very important never to run. So if we had a bear charging us, what we'd want to do is stand our ground, stand very close together. It makes us appear larger right. and more threatening to the bear, actually, but he may call off his charge. We could also try shouting. That might startle the bear into turning around. If the bear does make full body contact, then the important thing is to play dead. Because if he makes contact, it's not that he's hungry and wants to eat you. It's because he perceives you as a, as a threat. Mm -hmm. If you play dead, the threat has been removed and he has achieved his goal. At that point, he may leave you alone. Well, that's some good advice. I wonder if you can keep it when one comes charging at you. <laughs> well, I guess if you live to talk about it, you've survived. Yeah. Look at all the blueberries. I know, I'm getting hungry just looking at them. It's a nice little freshwater stream. You know, I think this waterfall is too high an obstacle for the salmon to make it up. Yeah, so there's probably no concern for bears around here. A couple of them fishing out there, I think. Oh, yeah. Look over to the right, there's a caribou. Oh, yeah, look at that rack. That's impressive. He must be out there to get away from the mosquitoes. Yeah. I thought you said there weren't any trails up here. I did say that, but the guys that made this trail weigh 800 pounds. Bears made this? Bears have been traveling across this tundra for generations. In fact, there's a whole network of trails all along this shoreline. That's so they can get back and forth from the food supplies and things? That's right. At high tide, they can't walk along the beach, so they come up here. Hey, take a look at this, John. What's that? Looks like a bear has been digging here. Hmm. What were they digging for? Well, they're probably looking for grubs or roots to eat. They'll get down in here with their forepaws and start flinging dirt to the side. Bears will eat just about anything. <laughs> Apparently. In fact, in other places I've seen bears dig up entire hillsides looking for ground squirrels. Really? Seems like a lot of work for a little tiny squirrel, doesn't it? Yeah, well, when there aren't salmon running, it's about the only thing left to eat, that and berries. Yeah. There are a lot of bear through here. Hey, check this out. Is this bear hair? Well, this hair is either moose, caribou, but I think you're right. It does look like brown bear. Uh -huh. See, in the spring, the bear will start sh shedding their winter fur. Right. And it makes their skin itch. So what they do is they find a post like this, back into it, and scratch. So this thing is just a big scratch pole, huh? That's right. Now, how can you tell that that's grizzly hair? What, what gave it away? Well, the tips are gray. The old timers used to call that grizzled. And that's where the name comes from? Grizzly? The nickname grizzly bear, right? Yeah. Okay, we have to watch our step here, John. It gets pretty narrow. Yeah. Boy, it stinks up here like dead fish. What's, what's that from? Well, it could either be a, a bear or an eagle that just had a meal up here. What would the bear be doing way the heck up here on this narrow little outcropping? Well, when the tide is up and they can't go out on the, on the flats, they uh -huh. like to bed down here and keep an eye on things. 
great place to scope things out, I'll tell you that. You really get the whole panoramic view from here. In fact, there's a bear right there on the tide flat. You got one? Yeah, he's way out there, though. Digging for clams, you think? He's probably out there following the tide as the tide goes out. It's obvious a bear has been here recently. We'd better be extra careful. Yeah, good point. Seems like there's a lot of driftwood here, you know, and it's, it's all been cut. What's going on? Well, they come mostly from a logging operation near Kodiak. Uh-huh. And the winter storms deposit them high on the beach. And here's another bear sign. Yeah, what's this? This is where a bear is bedded. See, they'll get down in the sand, and they'll scoop out a hollow like this. Uh-huh. Looks like a nice little comfortable spot to sit. What are they doing here? Well, they like to lay down near salmon streams and wait for the fish to run. Mm -hmm. But at high tide, they'll move up on top of the bluffs and bed in the tall grass. Huh. You know, it seems like grizzlies spend an awful lot of time down here along the shore. They do. In the summer, especially, they come here to fish, and they'll go out in the tide flats and dig for clams. Mm -hmm. And late in October, when the salmon have stopped running, they'll move into the high country and feed on berries. And that's when they're nice and plump and fat and ready, getting ready to hibernate? That's right, but it's not a true hibernation, which is when there's a decrease in the heart rate and the body temperature goes down. Mm -hmm. Rather, they go into a deep sleep. And in the winter, if you happen upon a bear den, the bear could actually wake up and be in a really bad mood. Ooh, I wouldn't want to be there. So when do they come out and start roaming around again? Well, here in Katmai, the males, or boars, will come out in early April. Mm -hmm. And they'll gradually make their way down to the coast. Huh. Well, if I'm hearing you correctly, then the, probably the safest time to be up here backpacking is when the bears are the best fed, which would be like uh, late summer into fall. That's right. It's also the best time to hike because the weather is most enjoyable. Yeah. Looks like some fresh scat down there. It does. It's fairly common, actually. He may have been bedding down here. Oh, I see you already have your sandals on. Hey, are you going to catch any salmon with that fishing pole, or are you just going to dream about it? <laughs> I'll try to do some fishing later. But you know, I don't really like to rely on it for my food source. Oh, really? Well, you see, we'd be competing directly with the bears. Huh. They're really possessive about their food and also their feeding territory. In some places, they've actually learned to steal fish caught by people. Now that's a scary thought. Pulling your line in and you got a grizzly on the other end of it? Imagine having to play a bear. No thanks. Alaska is a remote area. Where we are, it's 100 miles to the nearest village. And that's on the other side of a mountain range with no roads in or out. So with that in mind, we brought in a few extra items. First thing is fire starter. Fire starter will help you get a fire going quickly, say if you have to signal someone, or if you need to dry out, or if your camp stove just quits. And where we are, if something breaks, we can't go home. So we've got a repair kit that'll fix everything from a broken pack strap to a delaminated boot sole. First aid kit, we've got the standard items, but we've also added the chemical heat pack. Hypothermia, or exposure, can occur at any time when you realize that it can rain for up to four weeks here and get cold extremely fast. The heat pack will last up to seven hours. Iodine. While this area is known for its pristine wilderness, there's enough wildlife to where most water sources carry giardia or bacteria, just like everywhere else. A signal mirror and an aerial flare. Since we're almost totally dependent on a bush pilot to get us in and out, a lot can go wrong. Say if you injure yourself, you might miss your rendezvous with the pilot. So to use a signal mirror, you want to line it up by holding your palm between the object you're trying to signal and the light source. And when you get the reflection on the bottom of the palm of your hand, you just pull your palm of, palm of your hand away. Now if you want to vary the signal, you can just put your hand in front of it like that. Since it's overcast seven out of ten days up here, that's why we have the aerial flares. Well, check the map, John. As soon as we cross this river, I think we can head to the beach. Okay. The wind is blowing pretty hard. Mm -hmm. If there's any bears upwind from us, they may not be able to, to smell or hear us. Okay. So I think we should move real slowly, be careful, and make some noise. All right. You know, this thing about talking out in bear country, I think it's as much for calming everybody down as it is letting the bear know you're there. You know, it helps with my nerves. Yeah. In fact, look over there. There's some grizzly tracks. All right, the first ones. 
Wow. Now, what distinguishes that as a bear track? Well, there are the well-separated toes uh -huh. and the claw marks. This looks like it's a, a hind leg because there's a the heel has mm -hmm. left a, an impression in the mud. Yep. How big do you think that one was? Well, this is an adult. I've seen tracks, though, that are this big. Yeah. And claws like this. Yo. How long ago do you think it got here? Or it came here? Well, it looks like he was walking through the intertidal. Uh -huh. So anywhere between 6 and 12 hours. Well, it looks like he's heading upstream. Probably to his favorite fishing hole. Mm -hmm. If he went that way, why don't we go this way? Good idea. I'd say that's about a, what, size 12 <laughs> against my size 10? Well, it's another half a mile from here to the beach. Mm -hmm. Looks like there are some salmon jumping over here. Oh, nice. Here's an iodine tablet, Carl. Thanks. Hey, have you ever had a bear come into camp? I have, as a matter of fact. I was sea kayaking in Kenai Fjords not long ago, and I was camped on a really small beach. It was so tight that I couldn't safely separate the tent site from the cooking area. Uh -huh. I was also backed by a steep and high cliff. And I thought I wouldn't have any trouble from bears. But late that night, I heard some rocks fall. And not long after that, I saw these two long, hairy legs oh. walk in front of my tent door. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The bear sniffed my food bag, sniffed the stove, sniffed the pots, and couldn't have been the least interested. Huh. Then he walked over to my sea kayak and took a bite out of the bow. <laughs> Not long after that, he walked off the beach. So the moral of that story must be uh, never sleep near your sea kayak, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so what are we going to do about storing food up here? Well, in most places, what we would do is bag the food and hang it from a tree so that a bear couldn't reach it. Uh -huh. But there are no suitable trees here, so we have to take extra precautions. We want to avoid is any foods with a strong odor. So I like to take pasta, rice, dried soups. Also, there are dehydrated fruits and vegetables, like these red peppers, and put everything in a plastic bag. For instance, this oatmeal is placed in a plastic bag and sealed, then placed in a second plastic bag, which is also sealed. That is placed in a garbage bag, which I knot, taking all the air out of the bag first, put it into a second garbage bag, which is also knotted, and that all is placed in a zipper duffel bag. So and then you just leave it right out on the beach? And I've never been bothered by bears. What are we going to do about cleaning up dishes? Well, first of all, you never want to cook more than you can eat. But if there's anything left, I just put a little sand in the pot, scour it out really carefully, and take all of it out far into the inner tidal and dump it amongst the rocks. Hmm. In fact, since you did the cooking, I'll take care of these. Oh, hey, thanks. Okay. I think I'm going to go turn in. Okay, I'll see you later. It may seem odd to talk about sleeping when there's still so much daylight, but it's actually 11 o'clock up here. You know, we're only a few degrees below the Arctic Circle, where the sun doesn't even set in the summer. But we'll still get about four to five hours of semi-darkness tonight. Well, you said bears didn't like to hang out with each other. Those two look pretty friendly. They're actually very antisocial. They don't tolerate each other's presence at all, except in the spring when they come together to mate. Well, what's this I've heard about boars going in and actually, do they eat the cubs? The sows are very aggressive for that very reason when they come out of the den in the spring, because uh, boars are attracted to these denning sites and will go after the cubs. Well, I told you they're not very gregarious. Once I saw six males feeding on a single whale carcass at the same time. So that's a, an exception, and I'm not even certain why they would tolerate each other, except that it was an opportune moment for them to be feeding. Mm. What was also interesting about that same time is that after the boars had gorged themselves on this whale meat, they moved away into the tall grass, and not long after that, several sows with their cubs came down to feed on the same carcass. Sounds like what I see at my uh, local pancake breakfast. <laughs> I'll bet there's some happy bees in this field of fireweed. You know, the fireweed blooms from the bottom of the stock to the top. Uh -huh. And they say that when the last blooms have come out at the very top of the stock, that the snow will fall. Hmm. Looks like we got a couple months anyway, huh? Well, the end of August, I think. All right, there's a bear right now. Looks like he's fishing. Yeah?
This really is wild country, but that doesn't have to mean it's inaccessible. You know, I came up to Alaska with a lot of apprehension. And after a short time, I found that while they aren't teddy bears, grizzlies aren't monsters either. As Carl said at the beginning of the show, with sound judgment and a lot of common sense, you can travel safely in grizzly country. See you next time on another trail site. Have you ever felt grizzly fur? Yeah, well, I have once, John. It feels like a dense mat, you know? It has longer hairs and a real thick, short hair that's much more dense closer to the skin. Well, what kind of fox do you think that is? It's probably a red fox. You know, what's he doing down here? Scavenging. Same thing the bears will be doing soon. Walking on these tidal flats is nice, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is, except when the tide comes in, we're gonna have to go back up on the bluff. Oh, yeah. Now, what's that we're looking at out there? That's Kodiak Island. How far away you figure that is? Oh, about 35 miles. You know, bears are scavengers. They'll eat just about anything that they find. Kelp, amphipods, I've seen them eat the carcasses of sea lions and whales. So just about anything that lives or is washed up in the tidal zone. Alright, look at the gulls wheeling around. Funding for Trailside is made possible in part by Chevy Trucks, who reminds you that it's possible to have fun outdoors and still leave Mother Nature with a smile on her face, too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And high-tech sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure. Uh, guys, we're about ready to come in and block this thing out and, uh, and do it. Wouldn't mind doing one more. Wouldn't mind doing another one? Let's do the wild sound right now. Do this now, wild track right here. And Rolling. You want me to be walking? 52, take two. And action! So they're down here to get fish? Is that why they're, they're waiting on the, they're mixing their diet between fish and clams. Uh -huh. Bush pilots are more than just cab drivers for the skies up here. They take on almost a revered status since they represent the major link between most other places civilized. They also have a unique view on life and it's well worth your time to buy a bush pilot a cup of coffee just to hear the stories. And happy everybody, action! I see you already have your sandals on. Hey, you gonna catch any salmon with that fishing pole or are you just gonna dream about it? <laughs> well, I'll do some fishing later, but I don't like to rely on it for my food source. Oh, really? Well, we'd be competing directly with the bears. And they can be really possessive, not only of their food, but of their feeding territory. Oh. In some places, bears have actually learned to steal fish caught by people. Well, now that's a scary thought, pulling in your line and having a grizzly on the other end of it. Imagine having to play a bear. Oh, no, thanks. Where we are, oh. Alaska is a remote area. Where we are, it's 100 miles to the nearest village. And that's on the other side of a mountain range with no roads in or out. So with that in mind, we brought in a few extra items. For starters, fire starter. Fire starter can help you build a, why did I do this? God. So with that in mind, we packed in a few extra items. The first thing is fire starter. Fire starter will help you build a fire quickly, say to signal someone, or if you have to dry out, or if your camp stove poops out on you. Poops out on me? Ah! Alaska itself is an experience, but grizzlies are one of those rare moments you'll have in the outdoors, something you don't soon forget. I'd read up on grizzly bear prior to doing this show in Alaska, and one of the books I read traced every known bear attack, and surprisingly, it found little in common in terms of 
the cause beyond the obvious. And that is, there's probably like three things that they said would prompt a grizzly bear attack on a human. That is a surprise of, or almost a self-defensive re response from the grizzly bear. And secondly, they said threatening a mother's cubs would obviously generate a response. And also threatening a food source, since grizzly bear are well known to be stashing food and hide, hiding it, say, under alder branches. And you may inadvertently come across one of those. But really, the rest of all the reasoning for bear attacks, at least this particular study found out, is mostly hearsay. Our off and on-camera experts for this show pretty well confirmed these findings and softened my image of grizzly even further. Of course, I still wouldn't be fool enough to dangle fresh sardines around my neck while traveling in grizzly country in the early spring. As Carl said at the beginning of the show, with a sound judgment and a lot of common sense, you can travel safely in grizzly country. See you next time on another Trailside. Cut! Happy birthday! We were lucky to have as one of our grizzly bear experts on the show a man named Eberhard Brunner. He has spent at least 30 years along the Katmai coast with grizzly bear. But he's probably best known internationally for his outdoor photography. In fact, a few years ago, he was named Photographer of the Year by a prestigious group of professional outdoor publishers. Our on-camera guest and grizzly bear expert, Carl Schock, not only has backpacked extensively, he's also sailed his own boat around the world, including what he called a beyond-reality experience around the tip of South America. This episode of Trailside focused on grizzly bear, but everywhere you look in Alaska, you see raw, untamed wildlife and wild land. It's one place that man and machines hasn't spoiled. At least yet. You know, that could be guy could be end up coming right at us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go over there? As we do on all our trail side shows, we were using a wide angle lens really to shoot. So there are some interesting effects you may not realize that are created by that kind of a lens. It's only a few feet from my face when we're talking, that everything behind me is exponentially further away. So remember this as I turn my back on a grizzly to sign off of this episode. In reality, I was only 25 feet away from that one. I'm glad he was busy fishing. nice when you work for it. Water dictates a lot of things up here, including your clothing system. For instance, to save on wear and tear of the boats, we like to load and unload them while they're still in the water. And that makes these knee-high rubber boots the preferred footwear. I also like to pack in a pair of lightweight hiking boots for use around camp. Now, water on your feet, water on your head. With 150 inches of precipitation a year in this area, you have to plan on cold, wet conditions. And that means a bomb-proof rain gear system, both pants and jacket. Now, for the rest of your clothing, you want to err on the side of warmth and be happy 
if you didn't use it all, but reassured that it's there in case you need it. Now in cold, wet conditions, you want to avoid using cotton and down. Choose wool or synthetics instead. And don't forget about your head and hands. You know, you lose 50% of your heat through your head. For my hands, I like to use neoprene gloves or these specially designed paddling mitts. You know, camping out, especially in the rain, is not a time to be standing around with an instruction sheet learning how to set up your tent for the first time. So take some time before you leave home to set up your tent and get familiar with it. Now I'll be using a hammock tent while I'm out here, because unlike Francisco, you can't always count on having a flat spot, and when you do find a flat spot, chances are it's likely to be wet. A hammock tent also gets you up off the ground and away from any crawling insects, although there aren't that many in here, here in El Junkie to worry about. Recognize this knot. Here's our trucker's hitch again. Let's string this guy right up. On we go. And there we have it. Home sweet home. The caver's choice are headlamps. This is a more traditional headlamp system. It's a carbide light. The fuel source is fairly inexpensive and fairly lightweight. But to tell you the truth, the fumes can be pretty smelly, and in a tight space, I don't want to be around this thing. Let's just set that over here. The system that's been developed by miners uses a rechargeable battery pack. It's very bright. Batteries last up to 12 hours, but they weigh a ton. A system that's been developed for more general purposes are these battery-powered lights. This one uses four AA batteries and lasts up to six hours. Camper's choice is this lighter version, which uses two AA's and lasts up to two hours. Now, whenever you're caving, you should have at least three sources of light. And that means two good backup systems. And that's a flashlight and a pocket light. Beyond that, don't forget to bring extra batteries and extra bulbs. secret on sand, Sarah. Well, you got to remember to keep looking ahead, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to keep your forward momentum going. And uh, sometimes that's going to require you to uh, get a little bit, have to shift to an easier gear, okay, to keep that cadence up high. Okay. And if you still have problems, we can take a little bit of air out of your <sighs> tire. Want to okay. try that? Yeah, let's do that. Let's try that. Not too much. What this does this kind of allows your tires to float a little bit better in the sand instead of digging a big old trench. Okay, okay. got it. And the same, you know, it applies the same in mud and snow. Mm -hmm. By looking ahead, you keep your forward momentum going in the general direction that you want to go, and, and you don't want to do any abrupt changes, okay? You really want to finesse your bike. Okay. High cadence and stay balanced on the bike. And stay seated, seated, I guess, because that back wheel really spins out from under you, doesn't it? Right. Well, I know that was safe, Brian, but it still felt creepy. How do you, what do you do if you're caught in an avalanche? It's pretty difficult to fight the power of an avalanche, but if you do get caught in one, mm -hmm. the first thing you should do is use a swimming motion yeah. to keep your head above the moving snow. Yeah. And as you feel the avalanche start to slow down, try and fill your lungs with air and then use your hands to form a pocket in front of your mouth. Uh -huh. And the bottom line is, you know, still you got to use common sense and be aware of your surroundings. Yeah. Baja, the waters are emerald green and the skies are clear. But certain neighborhoods can get a bit noisy. Join us as we paddle the waters of the Sea of Cortez on Trailside. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.